Hello, everyone. We are going to get started for this evening. We are your hosts. My name is Maria Zerwanka. And I'm Grace Snyder. And we'd like to welcome you all to Boost. Boost. <laughs> Boost is organized annually by the Delta Emerging Leaders, also known as the Dells. The Dells work in a variety of sectors by day, but come together as volunteers to promote environmental causes in the Midwest as the associate board for the Delta Institute. We'd like to think of it, these four thinkers, as building opportunities for original and sustainable thinking, or perhaps boosting their communities. For those of you who, excuse me, for those of you who haven't attended before, Boost is a live pitch competition for entrepreneurs environmentally and socially sustainably minded entrepreneurs in the Midwest. And it isn't just a fundraiser. We are here to help connect you to local environmental entrepreneurs and expand our community and network of like-minded like people. Excuse me. Uh, Boost serves as a platform for these entrepreneurs to pitch their ideas in real time to you. And you, the audience, are the true holders of the power. This evening, you will be voting for these entrepreneurs with the best idea. And don't worry, we'll explain the voting process in just a little bit. The Dells received many applications for Boost, and we've carefully selected our four finalists for this evening based on four criteria. One, each startup's potential contribution to solving complex environmental challenges. Two, how each entrepreneur's personal background and experience shapes their ability to address environmental sustainability. Three, how each startup is committed to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially for BIPOC communities, the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community, and women's entrepreneurship. And four, the financial stability of their startup, such as current planning, revenue models, and intended use of funds. And as you can see, we have many sponsors who made tonight's program possible. We want to thank this year's. Our presenting sponsors, the American Family Insurance Institute for Corporate and Social Impact, United Airlines, and William Blair. The platinum sponsors, MSI Express, the People's Gas Community Fund, and West Monroe. Our gold sponsor, RW Ventures. And our green sponsors, Clayco, Elevate, the Walter S. Mander Foundation, and Atelbert Williams. Can we get a round of applause for all these sponsors supporting sustainable entrepreneurship? As we mentioned, the Dells are the Volunteer Associate Board for Delta Institute. Here to say a few words about Delta's work is their Senior Director for Development and Communications. Please give it up for Sydney Freitag Fay. Good evening, everyone. My sincere apologies to the MCs for having such a complex name. Please just think of me as Sid. So, just wanted to go ahead and let you know that I'm gonna keep things super brief because you're gonna be hearing from far more interesting people than me. But the long and the short of it is I'm Sid, and I work for Delta Institute, and I'm a lifelong Midwesterner. And long before there was ever a word for it, I grew up as a genderqueer farm kid, surrounded by rural poverty, halfway between Peoria and the Mississippi River. So my hometown of 900 didn't have a climate action plan. We didn't have a plan to mitigate all the heavy rainfall that brought in phosphorus, nitrogen, and other pollutants into our town's drinking water. Like many resource-constrained communities, we did the best that we could. And we often took a patchwork quilt approach to addressing all the many needs that we had. And so really, that's what brings me here tonight to be with all of you. And that's why I work for Delta, which is what I like to think of as a scrappy but strong nonprofit of about $2.5 million with some really major goals. Between now and 2025, 
we plan on impacting 5 million Midwesterners. We plan on working in 250 communities across the region. We're going to be working with 1,000 farmers to transfer a million acres to conservation-focused agriculture while increasing the farm's sustainability and profitability, because we can't talk about agriculture without talking about finances. Further, we're going to be capturing 100 million gallons of stormwater on an annual basis to mitigate flooding in resource-constrained communities, which, by the way, so many of our partners, while being resource-constrained, are also BIPOC majority. So flooding is also an issue of equity, as an issue of ensuring that every single Midwestern community gets the services that they deserve. Further, we are looking to have 100 million invested in our partner communities at the, for municipal green infrastructure. Because more trees, wetlands, bioswales, and permeable pavement will help all of our partner communities be more resilient as the impacts of climate change will only accelerate. So, with all that in mind, that's really where we're headed. So, I'd like you to just really get a chance to learn more about us. Our website is spread everywhere. So, we have a whole wide variety of handouts printed on recycled paper, naturally. So just get a chance to learn about us. Also consider if there's a way to partner with us, because regrettably, there's no shortage of need in our amazing home region. But that also means that there's no shortage of opportunity as well. So just want to do a quick round of appreciation to all of you to being here tonight, to learning about all of these issues, to spending time with us. I want to give a shout out again to the Delta Emerging Leaders for all of the great work that they're doing. I also want to thank the Kaplan Institute at Illinois Tech for this gorgeous room. For those of you who are joining us virtually, I'm sorry, things are awesome here. But I know that you're having a great time being at home in your jammy jams and also maybe with your cat on your lap. So, I also want to thank all of our sponsors. I want to thank United Airlines. I want to thank American Family Insurance. I want to thank William Blair. And I want to thank the fact that all of our sponsors joining us tonight are as passionate or more so about sustainability as what we are. So again, please enjoy yourselves. Also, in true Midwest fashion, please eat. We have so much food. Go make yourself a plate. Again, for those of you at home, I'm super sorry. The food's also great. So, thank you. Thank you, Sid. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Boost started in 2012, and since then, we've awarded 75,000 of unrestricted funds to 18 organizations in the Midwest. It's pretty incredible. And tonight, we're excited to see some of our Boost community continue to grow here. Our 2019 and 2021 Boost winners are also here tonight. Janice Newson from Lillian Augusta and Tessa Virk from Chicago Tool Library will share how their organizations use Boost funds over the past couple of years. Janice. Hi everyone, my name is Janice and I'm here with Lillian Augusta, which is the business that the Delta Institute was very kind to be the first giver to our business for a grant of $5,000. And what Lillian Augusta is striving to do is to create plant-based hair extensions. The motivation behind starting this business was my own experience with wearing braids. They can be very itchy and irritating to the skin and diving a little bit deeper into why this is happening. I found out that it's made from very hazardous material. It's the same material that goes into the pipes under your sink. It causes skin irritation. It is cancerous material and unfortunately it is seldom recycled. So 
learning all this, I was very alarmed to know that it poses a health concern to myself, it poses an environmental concern, and it's not comfortable to wear. So looking at all of that, I decided to create something that was better, something that was safer to wear and safer for the environment, which is how Lillian Augusta was born. And I started this in grad school and with the Delta Institute, I received the very first grant to actually work on this. And it started pretty much with me twisting twigs together and calling it hair. And it's come all the way to hair that actually looks and feels like hair. So I'm very grateful to have won this grant from the Delta Institute and to receive their support, which led to a number of other grants. And having that vote of confidence really was able to get me off the ground and push Lillian Augusta to further leaps and I'm still working on it today, so I'm really happy to be here, and thank you so much to Boost. And I will now pass it to Tessa with the Tool Library. I really appreciate this little podium. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tessa Bierk. I'm one of the co-founders of the Chicago Tool Library. Um, my wonderful co-founder, Jim, and I started it. Uh, we're a 501c3 in 2019. Um, the Tool Library, in case you're not familiar with the concept, we're a community center, and just like our wonderful public libraries, very similar, except that instead of walking in and seeing shelves full of books, you'll see shelves full of all kinds of tools and equipment that people can borrow. So we have everything from tools for gardening, home repair, bike and car repair, even stuff for cooking, cleaning, crafting, and camping. Super useful to Chicagoans that don't have a lot of space or disposable income to spend on all this stuff, um, or the desire to own it themselves. Who needs all that? So we really work to make these items available to anybody in Chicago to borrow instead of buying them. We want it to be super low cost, super easy, and really familiar, like a library. Um, so in the three years since opening, we've had over 3,000 Chicagoans sign up to use the tool library uh, from every single zip code in Chicago, which makes me very proud. People really don't go across Chicago for things, <laughs> so the fact that we've managed to snag people from every zip code means a lot. Um, and we've now saved the community almost $800,000 in tool purchases and rentals, which is super cool. Um, because of our Boost Grant win last year, uh, we were able to kickstart the process of hiring our first part-time staff member, which is super huge for a teeny tiny nonprofit like us. Uh, and now in 2022, we're doing even bigger things. This is an incredibly big year for us. We are in the process of absorbing a whole other nonprofit. Uh, we're taking on 5,000 more tools, a huge building, uh, and we're also gonna take on the mission of the other nonprofit. So we lend items to individuals. This other nonprofit lends items to uh, nonprofits, other nonprofits, schools, block clubs, faith-based organizations. So we're going to do that too. And we're super excited to see how that's going to impact the community when all of these other community leaders also have the tools they need to do the stuff that they want. Um, so we're just really, really racing to meet the demand for our services. We're so grateful to Boost and the Delta Institute because you know, this grant really lowers the barrier to entry for sort of scrappy environmental projects, and I can't stress how important that is. Um, as the concept of environmentalism and sustainability is changing super, super fast to meet our changing world, um, opportunities like this that lower that barrier to get people working on really important and creative and innovative projects is super important. It meant a lot to us as a non-traditional environmental project. Um, so thank you to the Delta Institute. We're super happy to be here, and I'm super excited to hear more from these other groups today. If you want to learn more about us, you can visit chicagotoolibrary.org, donate, <laughs> volunteer, become a member. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Janice and Tessa. I mean, man, scrappy sustainability focus groups. It's pretty awesome, right? Um, just wanted to welcome you again to being here, uh, for being here. And I also want to encourage you to get involved. Follow them on social media, check in with them, see what you can do. And um, we are so glad to be here in person tonight. And to those of you who are here virtually, thank you so much. Um, we'd like to thank our generous host this evening, the Ed Kaplan Family Institute for Innovation and Tech Entrepreneurship here at Illinois Tech. Before we introduce this year's finalists, I'd like to welcome Kaplan Institute's director, to the stage, she's the program director here. 
And she also serves as the co-chair to Delta Institute's Development Committee. Please welcome Naharika Hunglum. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just really excited to welcome all of you. My name is Niharika Hanglum. I serve on the board of directors for Delta Institute, and I am also the program director here at the Kaplan Institute. Today is so special for me because I get to put on both my hats. Sometimes, you know, when I'm in rooms and just talking to people, I'm either putting on my Kaplan Institute hat or my Delta Institute hat, and today I get to do both. So this is just really, really exciting for me. Um, you know, I've had the privilege of serving on the Delta Institute board for the last two and a half years um, and you know just very very delighted to be able to host all of you here today um, before we go into uh, you know the main event for the day I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Kaplan Institute it's the tech entrepreneurship and innovation hub here at Illinois Tech our focus really is around advancing equity in entrepreneurship uh, we do this by building community, uh, really driving, you know, student ventures to create impact and just bring some really innovative solutions to the world. Um, I feel like Boost is a perfect amalgamation of everything Kaplan stands for, and I'm really, really excited to have all of you here today. Um, I'm so inspired by all of your work. I'm so thrilled that all of you are here in this space. Um, you know, I could not be more delighted. So with that said, um, Welcome, welcome all of you, and thank you for being here. Okay, and now the part that you've all been waiting for, this year's finalists. How this will work is we will introduce each finalist, and then the finalists will have up to eight minutes to pitch their idea. After all the pitches, you'll have the opportunity to visit them at their tables over here to my right um, to ask them questions or anything else you may want to learn about their ideas. For virtual guests, we encourage you to visit their websites or social media channels to learn more. All guests, virtual and in-person, are going to receive a ballot via email after the finalists present. So just keep an eye on your phones and just make sure if you have any technical issues, we can help you out over here to my right as well. The top two entrepreneurs with the most votes will receive a $5,000 grant, and the two runners-up will each receive grants of $1,000. And once the finalists are done, we strongly encourage you to vote as soon as possible. The voting will be open, we'll announce it, and it will close sharply at 745 unless we have a time crunch, but we will let you know. Uh, it, again, it will automatically close at 745. If you have issues um, accessing the ballot, then you can come to the table over here if you're in person. If you're on Zoom, then please message the host and we'll help you out. Um, and remember, again, voting will close automatically at 745 if we're on time with no exceptions, so please take the time and don't wait. First up, we have... Is it a cup? No. Is it a coaster? It's for inside? No. Outside? Both, you say. And it's not made out of plastic? Baby Gami Co.'s mission is to get diverse families outside. Baby Gami Co. lives into its mission by creating the first of its kind space-saving baby products with fostering community. The bottles are a standard 10 ounces when fully open and collapse down to the size of a coaster. Please welcome Sana Joffrey from Baby Gummy Co. Where's the time? Am I? Let me know when I should start. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sana Joffrey, co-founder and CEO of Baby Gummy. I'm so excited to be here. I'm here to tell you about how we're improving the outdoors and environment for babies and families. At Baby Gummy, we're building a collapsible baby bottle that helps you save space and reduce waste. Um, okay, there we go. Um, my co-founder, Hootsie, and I are passionate about enjoying life outside with our kids. But we quickly realized it was really difficult to juggle our kids and all the stuff you needed to carry. I went to REI actually looking for a space-saving baby product to take my infants in camping. I saw the problem and decided to be the solution. Through our interviews with parents, 75% said 
space is a major issue when outdoors and traveling. And furthermore, through our interviews, parents told us that they want to have a product that can grow with their child. We know firsthand where moms, you have to buy a lot of stuff just to feed your child. On an average, an infant uses four to 12 bottles, four to six sippy cups, and at the toddler age, you can also go to open cups, as well as snack cups. You can do the math, that's a lot of stuff and a lot of waste. At Baby Gami, that's why we're building a baby bottle that's collapsible and multifunctional. Our bottle is more eco-friendly. Most traditional bo bottles are made of plastic, but our bottle is made of silicone, which is a safer, non-toxic alternative to, to um, plastic. It's also, um, it's also multi-purpose. We know in sustainability, our choices matter. We're aiming to, we're addressing environmental sustainability by building a baby bottle that's interchangeable, that will grow with your child. So it'll go from sippy cup to, to baby bottle to sippy cup to snack cup. Additionally, our plan is to have recyclable and compostable packaging. This innovation will have critical environmental impacts in Chicago and beyond. And let's talk about how big this market is and how big of an environmental impact it can have. Parents are spending a whopping $448 million alone on baby bottles, and that number is growing annually. Based on our research, and we've been doing work with um, manufacturing, the cost to produce our product will be $4.50. We aim to price our bottle between $20 to $30, and we've been testing this with, so with solution interviews and customers, and that's what they're willing to pay. This will allow us to have a gross margin of about 80%, which will allow us to work with wholesalers. We plan to have multiple revenue channels, so we plan to sell direct to consumer on our website, Amazon. We hope to partner with baby boutiques in Chicago and in the Midwest, as well as outdoor store and big box retailers. Um, we also hope to build partnerships with hospitals and not-for-profit groups that are mother and children groups. And currently, there's no direct competitor to Baby Gami. And as such, we're the only company building a collapsible, eco-friendly, multi-use bottle. Our closest competitor is The Nurse by Boone. It's already on the market, but isn't fully collapsible and is mostly plastic, as you can tell. And at Baby Gummy, our why is really about people and planet. How can we build a, better, build a better world for our family and for kids all to inherit a better world? And our why isn't just a statement, it's what drives our choices and design. And although Baby Gummy is, um, we're super excited to be here. Although Baby Gummy is building a, a product, our mission is to make it easier for families to get it outside. And we're doing that by not only building a product, but also a community. The, the community members are learning about responsible outdoor stewardship. So little kids are learning about low, no, um, no, uh, leave no trace behind, land restoration, water uh, sustainability. And we've been visiting parks like Big Marsh and um, out in the suburbs as well. Since April, we've hosted four events um, with over 120 parents and families. And we're so honored to be here today with Boost we're, and be finalists, and we know that other people are excited about what we're doing. Just this year, we were proud to be selected as one of 22 teams that were part of REI, uh, REI's Path Ahead Ventures program, which is a new program and an accelerator aimed at diversifying the outdoor industry and founders of color. The new program, um, Klitsia and I were, are from Chicago, and we were the only team selected from Chicago. Um, so super excited to rep the Midwest, just like Sid said. And we've been making exceptional progress in 2022. We started manufacturing. We've launched our e-commerce website. You can go to baby, babygamico.com, and we hope to launch our crowdfunding campaign in Q4 this year. And Kutsia and I make the perfect team with complementary skill sets. Kutsia is an alum of IIT. Woohoo! She's the engineer in operations, and I'm the visionary in sales. We're gritty and scrap scrappy, and we've also recruited advisors in how Lee of Founded Outdoors, Dan Kehenya of REI, and Aaron Thompson, a product developer here in Chicago with Rickery. We know we have what it takes, we just need a boost. With Delta Institute's boost support and your vote, we can ensure our bottle is more sustainable. We can finalize the design for our snack cup. That will make our product multi-purpose. It'll be a bottle, a sippy cup, and a snack cup. So this will help, help us reduce the number of products parents have to buy and decrease the number of items that are in landfills. 
So thank you so much for your time. Baby Gami is the next generation of environmentally responsible products, recreation for youth and families. Vote for us on our big adventure to save space and reduce waste. Please come see us at our booth where you can see the first, our prototypes, sign up for our wait list, and join our future community events. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. Now for our next finalist. Flooding is a huge problem for communities across the country. It's an environmental justice crisis that affects the quality of life in the country and in countless ways. And it requires support and action from public officials and utilities to redress these wrongs. Thank you. Illinois residents have endured floods and wastewater overflows in their neighborhoods for decades. The stormwater and sewage systems are broken and failing, leading to frequent floods and raw sewage backups into properties. These injustices have caused a public health crisis in this area. Please welcome Malika Hill of Centerville Citizens for Change. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me. My name is Malia Cahill and I am a community organizer working with Equity Legal Services and the group Centerville Citizens for Change. Centerville Citizens for Change, whom I will uh, refer to as CCC for short, wants to thank Delta Institute for inviting us to be one, uh, one of the four finalists. Also a huge congratulations to the other three finalists. Everyone is doing such great work and we're looking forward to hear more about everyone's ongoing efforts with their communities. So, Centerville uh, Citizens, Sorry, Centerville Citizens for Change, a quick overview of the issue. For at least 40 years, residents of Centerville in an area now known as Cahokia Heights near East St. Louis, Illinois, uh, residents have had to tackle extreme cases of flooding and raw sewage backups in their homes, on their properties, along, and alongside public roads. Uh, Centerville and its surrounding communities share the similar trait of being predominantly African American and almost half the residents are considered to be low income. Since as early as the 1980s, many of the residents have dealt with frequent flooding and sewage backups in their homes and on their properties and urgently need resources to constantly remove wastewater and to clean their homes. To date, uh, the needs have not been adequately met by local, state, or federal government programs, even though, as they would admit, they are well aware of the issue. So who is Centerville Citizens for Change? CCC began in October of 2018 as a group of concerned Centerville residents who met quarterly with pro bono attorneys to discuss the flood, uh, the stormwater and the sewage overflows that have plagued their communities, homes, uh, and yards for decades. Two years later, CCC was now a formal nonprofit organization consisting of community members and social entrepreneurs. We are dedicated to community development and often partner with community, um, local community organizations to provide free services to Centerville residents affected by stormwater flooding and sanitary sewage overflows. Uh, these can include pro bono legal assistance, free monthly drinking water, um, free home assessments, emergency flood water assistance, and community home repair. This grassroots community led startup uh, has multiple objectives, including the immediate elimination of the region's stormwater flooding with renovations and or reconstruction of not only to the city's stormwater and sewage systems, but to the residential homes in the area as well. So what's our mission? CCC is dedicated to advocacy, environmental justice, and community development. Uh, we make sure that our residents have access to clean drinking water, healthy and safe homes, and functional sewer and stormwater systems. But what does this, what do these issues look like? Well, let's take a look. So, we have uh, sanitary sewage overflows. In the images, you'll see how the roads are filled with contaminated water, riddled with human feces and pollution. Pits of odorous black sludge water appear frequently in sewer drains and in ditches along the roads. 
many of the residents have sewage contaminated water in and around uh, surrounding their yards, either standing and flowing like you can see in that video here. Residents have reported respiratory issues after years of inhaling raw sewage in and around their homes on a daily basis. But that's not all. The stormwater flooding. Our residents want to stay in their homes. Um, the residents are subject to constant stormwater floods, which result in toxic stormwaters entering and destroying their properties both internally and externally. With high water levels, residents are left trapped inside their homes, unable to leave at their own free will, and must be rescued by boat or wait for the water to recede, which can take days. Our program directly addresses the damage to residents' property structure. The constant contact with bacteria-filled stormwater weakens the foundation of homes. It creates mold and eats away at walls and ceilings, creating a hazardous living situation. Residents, both young and old, are often left without, hot, without heat after furnaces and other expensive possessions are destroyed routinely by the stormwater. Our residents want to stay in their homes. They do not want to leave, and this sediment is captured beautifully by one of our board members, Cornelius Bennett. He says, and I quote, no, I have never thought about moving. As far as I'm concerned, I'm gonna die right here. I'm not going anywhere. Resident properties and homes are destroyed and they desperately need repairs. So, what is, what are, what's the solution? Well, with such severe water damage to the homes and area over the years, uh, it becomes impossible to keep up with the necessary uh, amount of repairs in order to sustain a clean and safe place to live. And with so many of the homes also being low income, the result is devastating. Well, CCC and our board voted to create the Community Home Repair Program. This program is meant to directly assist with uh, residents in criti with critical home repairs to damaged properties caused by the stormwater flooding. This includes, but is not limited to, drywall reconstruction, roof repair, flooring and floor repair, foundation repair and support, mold and toxin treatment, this ongoing grant and donation funded program is the CCC's most direct hands-on attempt at saving the homes and their community from being completely destroyed by this environmental injustice. So what does support for CCC look like? Uh, of course, donations of money or cases of water. Uh, this boost grant uh, specifically would assist with funding for purchasing of actual construction materials, assist with paying for third party construction and assessment services for the homes, paying for cleaning supplies, air purifiers and dehumidifiers for residents' homes, purchasing of hot water heaters and furnaces for those that got destroyed or damaged. Uh, CCC is on a mission to save their community and you can help. Remember, vote for Cinnabelle Citizens for Change. Come talk to us at our table and visit our website at floodedandforgotten.com to donate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Malia. Okay. When was the last time you ordered something online? I know, I just put an order in right over there for dog food because I need to feed my dog. But what's gonna happen to all the packaging for all the boxes that I'm getting? What if it didn't just get thrown away? EcoShip is a community-focused 501c3 that collects gently used shipping materials from local communities and redistributes them to businesses helping them cut costs and implement sustainable business practices. Please welcome Alexander Pleva of EcoShip. So before I begin, I would like everyone to take a minute to think about the number of packages that you receive every week or every month. Now add your friends and family to that number, your coworkers, your neighbors, Chicagoans. Do you get anywhere near 1.6 million? Every single day, Amazon ships out 1.6 million packages. And while most of the packaging can be recycled in your typical blue bin, 
Other items such as bubble wrap and mailers like this, they cannot be recycled in your blue bin. These items are made out of low density polyethylene, which is a type of plastic, and it is a lot more difficult to recycle, but the upside is that you can reuse it multiple times. So over the last few years, you've probably seen a lot more packages being delivered, probably a lot more Amazon drivers on the road. And that's because during the pandemic, online shopping increased tremendously, as did the amount of packaging being used. Unemployment also increased. As individuals lost their jobs, they had to find alternatives. And luckily, a lot of them were able to uncover their passions and start small businesses. So now with the market being oversaturated, shipping and packaging material rates skyrocketed. So we have these packaging materials that are difficult to recycle but can be reused numerous times and increasing shipping and packaging rates. So why not reuse what we already have? Why not use the items that are already in circulation? This is where EcoShip comes, comes into play. Hi everyone, my name is Alexandra. I'm the founder and CEO of EcoShip. Over there is my partner, Peter, who helps me out with basically everything. He's the CFO. We both have environmental backgrounds, his being an environmental science major from Loyola University, mine being a biology major from Drake University, and we also come from immigrant families. So as kids, we grew up watching our parents um, reuse anything and everything they could get their hands on just to save a little bit of money. So when I met Peter a couple years ago, it didn't really surprise me that he was reusing packaging for his e-commerce business. I quickly started helping him collect more items by posting in various Facebook groups, and before I knew it, my whole closet was filled. Um, a lot of people did not know what to do with this packaging because it is so difficult to recycle, and so I decided to take a step further in this project. Um, and I started reaching out to businesses and individuals to see if there was anyone else that would be willing to reuse these items. And the answer was a resounding yes. In just six months, we were able to divert 9,004 mailers and 346 garbage bags of other packaging materials such as packing peanuts, air, um, air pillows, and uh, bubble wrap. So now we have EcoShip, a nonprofit, a community-based 501c3 nonprofit that collects gently used shipping materials from local communities and redistributes them to small businesses or large businesses, helping them cut costs and implement sustainable practices. We collect these items at various farmers markets, um, environmental markets, and we are also partnered with nine different businesses around Chicago and nearby suburbs who generously allow individuals to come by during their business hours and drop off their items. So by partnering with these local businesses, we encourage the local community members to not only support their neighborhood businesses, but pick up sustainable habits. So after these items are collected, they are sorted, um, inspected for quality purposes, and distributed to individuals or businesses that can reuse them. Up to date, just this year alone, we've helped over 156 businesses. We help them cut costs and become sustainable by providing them these materials completely free of charge. Every single month, we help these businesses save anywhere from 50 to $200. The money saved can go towards expansion, which we have already seen in so many of our customers. We have Janina, owner of Pretty Pearl Shop, who went from making jewelry part-time to now doing it full-time, being able to support herself and her family. We have Brian from Ola Verde Cafe, who went from selling his items at farmer's markets to now having his own online marketplace, which is absolutely crucial to small businesses. And we have Annie from Rise and Shine Ceramics, who used to make items in her apartment and now owns a studio where she helps other people learn how to make ceramics. 72% of the businesses that we have helped are women, BIPOC, and LGBTQ plus owned. So as we grow, we aim to help even more individuals in diverse communities. EcoShip is a new startup that's been independently funded and operated by Peter and myself. Our business model prioritizes efficiency and minimal overhead expenditure. On average, EcoShip costs around $600 a month to run and that includes storage fees, which is where we operate out of, um, traveling fees, so whether that's picking up materials or going to different collection events, 
and digital subscriptions. So with your vote, you would be securing EcoShip's several months of worry-free operations. You'd be giving us the opportunity to redesign our website, including our online marketplace, the opportunity to add more collection points in more neighborhoods around the city, and the opportunity to provide this free packaging to individuals who do not have access to transportation. You would also give us the opportunity to access professional counsel for the further development of EcoShip as an emerging nonprofit, and the opportunity to hire EcoShip's first employees. Your vote today would help set EcoShip up for a continued success. But it's a lot more than that. Your vote would empower the next new business owner who wants to chase their dreams without compromising their morals. You'd be giving the communities we currently reach and the ones within our site an opportunity to modify their spending habits and to become more accountable for their spending, for their online spending. You would be giving storefront owners access to hundreds of new customers that care about where their dollar goes and the impact that it has. With your vote, you're helping inject money, time, and effort directly back into communities that today, now than ever, um, need it tremendously. So how can you help today? Follow us on social media under EcoShip Chicago. Um, reach out to us. You know, if you have any items that you're dropping off, send, send us a picture, we love to see it. Um, start saving your items. Drop them off at our upcoming collection events or one of our drop-off points and volunteer with us. We can use every single set of hands. Thank you everyone, appreciate it. Thank you, Alexandra. Are you aware that three quarters of the state of Illinois is farmland? Did you know that the total agricultural sector alone accounts for about 11% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions? Rewilding Acres is an ecosystem restoration project that will transform commercial farmland into agrovoltaic site that combines excuse me, ecosystem restoration and organic farming to regenerate soil, sequester carbon, enhance food access, and create an experiential classroom. Please welcome Rosina Canchuala of Rewilding Acres. Well, I'm super inspired by all the other presenters, so congrats to all of you. Um, really excited. To, oops. Uh, let's see. All right, really excited to talk to you all about Rewilding Acres tonight, and I want to start by telling you a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in Illinois, and I went to college at U of I, and then after college, I lived in a lot of places that were not Illinois. Um, the pandemic brought me home and I decided to stay. And in my 15 years working in the environmental space, you can see some of the things that I've done here, um, I've kind of come with three takeaways. The first is that climate change is real and it's having real impacts on people and communities. Second is that we're caught in this vicious cycle where our modern industrial food system is contributing to the climate crisis and in turn, um, Climate change is making our food system much more vulnerable. And three, there is tremendous power in local community-based solutions to really build resilience and be a climate solution. So being back in Illinois, I realized that in my backyard, there is a tremendous problem and I can take my experiences and apply them to a solution. So what is this really big problem? Well, every day, U.S. agriculture emits 1.8 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. So as was mentioned, agriculture is a huge contributor to climate change. And if we zoom in on the Midwest, and particularly Illinois, we see that farming practices in this state are especially bad. And it's worth noting that the crops that are grown on Midwestern farms, namely corn and soybeans, don't get consumed as food. Um, a lot of the corn is actually um, goes to ethanol, which contributes to our greenhouse gas-based transportation system. And a very small amount is consumed in the form of high fructose corn syrup. So there are a lot of problems associated with conventional agriculture in the Midwest. So some of those problems are listed here. 
there is um, the destruction of ecosystems. So over 90% of wetlands have been drained for um, farming or other development projects. And that's a problem because that makes flooding, as was mentioned, much more likely um, in this region. And similarly, prairies, um, less than 1% of pre-settler prairies exist today. So with the destruction of these ecosystems, we're also losing um, plants and animals that are native to this region. Soil degradation is a huge problem. Currently, our agricultural system facilitates the loss of three billion tons of topsoil each year, which is just, we're destroying it up to 40 times the rate that we can replenish it. And this is a huge problem because soil can actually be this huge climate solution. It has the ability to pull carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the ground. So we really need to be working to build and maintain healthy soils, which is the opposite of what our current system is actually doing. Related to this is water pollution. Um, because of runoff, there's a growing dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is largely due to fertilizer runoff from Midwestern farms, which runs through rivers and streams and ends up poisoning the Gulf of Mexico. Also, nitrate is a primary chemical component of fertilizer that can run off farm fields and get into our drinking water supply. Air pollution from growing corn has been linked to 4,300 premature deaths a year in the U.S. And ammonia is a key culprit for air pollution from corn farms. And then, of course, our food system is increasingly being um, con concentrated into the hands of a few corporations, which means that farmers and consumers have less control over the quality of our food. So this is our vision. We want to take um, a 90-acre farmland in Elburn, Illinois, which looks a lot like the picture on the left, and transform it into something that looks more like the picture on the right. So pictured here is an agrovoltaic system, which means solar power paired with some sort of land-based um, practice. So here are some of the things that rewilding acres would consist of. So of course, uh, we want to do ecosystem restoration work. Um, we think community solar could be a win-win. Um, community solar is when people uh, don't have suitable roofs or they don't own their home, so they can't get solar on their homes, but they're still able to subscribe to a solar farm. And this would be an opportunity for rewilding acres to rent out a portion of the land to a solar developer as a source of income. We really want to have this space be um, for the community. So we really want to cultivate spaces where people can come together to learn, to learn from each other, to heal. Um, and then of course, outdoor access is super important. Um, we want to allow people to connect with the land and nature in a low stakes way and kind of challenge this assumption of who the outdoors are for. Um, and so here are some of our costs. So on the left are some of our fixed one-time costs, and really step one is a site assessment, which is priced at $13,000, and um, that will really give us an indication of where the drain tiles are located that were put in hundreds of years ago that you know, drained the wetlands, but in order to do wetland restoration work, we really need to do the site assessment so that we can begin that process. And so if we were to win today, um, we would put that money towards the site assessment and we've already raised half of the amount. Um, other costs include Procuring seeds, $2,000 per acre for prairie restoration is typical to get the right number and um, variety of seed plugs. And then some ongoing costs are listed here, rent, land management, things like that. And then there are some opportunities for income. So um, various ways that we can earn rent. Um, the solar lease was one of the ways that I mentioned, um, as well as experiential visits in the form of field trips or farm stays, various membership opportunities, and then grants and something called wetland banks, which um, we're doing some research into, but learning that um, if we have at least a 25 acre wetland, we would be able to um, get somewhere in the range of $100,000 per acre. Um, of course, there are a lot of benefits that don't always have a monetary value um, associated with them. 
So here is the start of our advisory council, which I'm super thrilled about. These three individuals just bring a, ho a wealth of knowledge and experience. We have one advisory member here today, one tuning in online. Um, so just really excited, and I should mention if what you are hearing sounds intriguing and you'd want to join the advisory council, definitely um, let's talk. We are committed to DEI, and this commitment is realized through our partnership with Ecologic, a nonprofit that I founded that inspires environmental action through education, art, and community. So Ecologic would be an organization that would rent space from rewilding acres to host its educational workshops as well as manage aspects of um, the land restoration. And Ecologic has a diverse leadership and we operate with the ethos that climate change is an intersectional issue that cannot be addressed without recognizing and dismantling other systemic injustices that exist. So we really prioritize um, recruiting diverse speakers, attracting diverse audiences to our programs, as well as ensuring that our programs are accessible for everyone through scholarships or other sliding scale registration systems. And I'm really excited that we're seeking um, input on a land acknowledgement statement from local indigenous peoples, but we also want to center traditional conservation and indigenous practices in our land restoration project. And we know that climate change requires all hands on deck and we will actively make our site a space that is inclusive and welcoming to people of all backgrounds. So here are some ways that you can help out. And if you don't see something on here, but you have ideas, please reach out. Um, this project is a step towards helping alleviate Illinois' agricultural contribution to climate change through a tangible solution, which we hope will be a blueprint for neighboring farms who can see the value in land restoration. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rosina. All right, can we get one more round of applause for all of our finalists? Okay, so for the next 20 minutes, you're free to grab more food. There is still plenty of food and drinks over here. Um, and you're also welcome to chat with all the finalists, ask them any questions you may have. Um, we are going to go ahead and open voting, and that will be open for 20 minutes. So. I have on my watch, it's 725 right now, so we will be closing voting promptly at 745. Um, and as a reminder, you should be getting an email. And again, to all virtual and in-person participants, we just emailed the ballot, or they will be, yeah, moments ago, I've got confirmation. Um, we emailed it to the address you registered when you signed up for the event. The top two entrepreneurs with the most votes will receive $5,000 grant each. And the two runner-ups will receive grants of $1,000. We strongly encourage you to vote as soon as you are ready in case you experience any technical difficulties and so that you don't run out of time. Voting will automatically close at 745 Central. Again, go to the table or get us in the Zoom website to, excuse me, the Zoom chat. If you have any issues accessing your ballot, in-person guests can please just visit our registration table over here to my right, and virtual guests can message the host in Zoom. Uh, if you remember, uh, we will close voting at 745, no exceptions, so please take the time you need to decide, but don't wait too long. Um, all votes are final, and you cannot change your vote after you submit. So happy voting, everyone, and we'll be back in 20 minutes. And enjoy the food. Yes, please come eat the food. Welcome back, everyone. We are moments away from finding out the two winners of Boost, who will each receive a $5,000 grant. The two runners up, as a reminder, will each receive a $1,000 grant as well. Delta CEO will be meeting with each of our finalists over the course of the coming few weeks to explore other ways in which Delta can help them advance their work. But first, another big round of applause to all of this year's applicants and finalists and the hard work they put into their pitches for this evening. Also, a special thanks again to Kaplan Institute for hosting us in this beautiful space. And once again, thank you to all of this year's sponsors, including William Blair, MS 
MSI Express, the People's Gas Community Fund, West Monroe, RW Ventures, Clayco, Elevate, the Walter S. Mander Foundation, and Ethelbert Williams. And now we'd like to pay a special recognition to our first presenting sponsor for the evening who underwrote the first of our two awards. They have a special video about their climate goals that they would like to share, and this is for United Airlines. I'm coming to you today from the Colorado Rockies, which is a great backdrop for talking to you about United's new commitment to be 100% green by the year 2050. And when we talk about being carbon free, we mean something different than what you've heard a lot of other companies say. This problem has been building for the last two centuries. True sustainability is about taking on the biggest culprit in our industry, the emissions generated by our aircraft. And so the only way to really solve the climate change problem is through sustainable fuels and carbon sequestration. We're not gonna do it the easy way. It's gonna take hard answers, hard solutions to solve this problem. But United Airlines is committed to doing the right thing for the long term. Since the technology to make our goal a reality doesn't all exist yet, we're going to help build it. As part of our 2050 commitment, we're gonna invest in a carbon sequestration project. These are projects that literally take carbon out of the atmosphere and pump it into the ground where it can stay for millions of years. I have six kids with one on the way, and I want to leave this kind of backdrop for those seven kids and their kids and all the generations to come. We are the ones that have to stop hunting the problem down the road. We can't continue to gradually evolve. And this is our chance to start a revolution and make a difference that will last for generations to come. While other airlines may continue to offset the problem, we're going to work hard to solve the problem before you even take your seat. After all, your journey begins before you board our plane, and so should ours. And to present the next Boost Award is Beth Churchill, representing our presenting sponsor, the American Family Insurance Institute for Corporate and Social Impact. Thank you, Beth. This final moment that everybody's like, okay, get on with it. But I want to tell a story first, very quick. Um, so I wanted to tell a little bit of story about the American Family Institute for Corporate and Social Impact. I am I serve as one of the community and social impact um, advisors. We focus on four areas in uh, closing equity gaps in America, economic empowerment, climate and community resilience, healthy youth development, and equity in education. Pretty excited to be able to hand out this award. Um, we are uh, support um, social venture capital firms and we're a partner of choice for exceptional entrepreneurs who are building scalable, sustainable businesses focusing on closing equity gaps in this country. We are national and we are also in our backyard, Madison, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Chicago, and the greater Great Lakes region. In addition, we know that capacity building depends on these amazing leaders that just presented tonight in their organizations and their communities. And we show up in those spaces where those are leading social causes. Um, it is my great pleasure to be here with five, four other peers of mine, two online and two in the room here. So there's five of us from the Institute representing tonight. And I wanna thank Sana for your vision for Baby Gami. I definitely wanna thank Malaika, yeah, I practice, Malaika, did I do that well? Malaika and Walter for bringing us into your community, Citizens for Change. Definitely want to thank Alexandra for your ecoship operation, and of course Rosina for your dream for Rewilding Acres. 
You all did such a tremendous job tonight, so this is all for you. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. So for now, I want to the privilege to present the other audience favorite award. Audience favorite award. The audience favorite award goes to EcoShip. Um, thank you to Sarah. I know she's watching online. She had me on her podcast, one of the first podcasts that I've been on, and she told me to apply, and I did. Thank you, Patrick, for reaching out as well. It means the world. Thank you to my partner, Peter, and his whole family that have supported us since the beginning. <laughs> thank you to all my friends watching online. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And again, thank you to our finalists. All four of you are doing incredible work. Um, so with that in mind, tonight you are an audience. Tomorrow you are stakeholders and vehicles for all the finalists to be successful. As investors in these businesses, we encourage you to check in on your investments. Follow them on social media and their websites to see where their projects go and get involved. In the past, we've had audience members offer pro bono legal services, marketing, consulting, and more. When we all come together, we have the capability to lift each other up so that these organizations can keep on moving up and we can creatively solve the environmental challenges our region faces. We'll begin closing up for this evening in about 10 minutes. Until then, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you so much again for coming. We will see you next year and please keep an eye out for an, uh, survey that we'll be sending out next week. So we'd love to hear your feedback. And thank you very much.